Well, the Lord be with you. you. Just checking I wasn't with the Baptists today. (laughs) Uh, It's a huge privilege for me to uh, be here today, Um, particularly at such an important moment in your own uh, diocesan journey. Um, And I suppose particularly to to share something about what we've been learning over the years at uh, LICC, about 10, 15 years now, about how we can help people grow confident in the God who walks with his people in the daily and the ordinary. And we've been learning, if you like, up and down the country with uh, diocese from Carlisle to Truro, from Litchfield to Bath, from Southport to Gateshead with vicars and curates, parishes, deaneries and dioceses. Of course, uh, every context is different and yours is different. And on this day, uh, you walk behind Jesus like Peter and John And who's it for any of us to say to another, walk in the same way? I just pray this day that the Lord will be giving you something from what we've learned that will help you in your following of him. Um, Before we go, just a little bit of personal organisational background so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, Some of you know I used to work in advertising, so you can trust uh, every word you hear from me and uh, every picture you see. I actually spent 10 years working in advertising in London and in New York, and I loved it. I imagine many of you have done a variety of jobs in your time, and hopefully some of them you love, and hopefully you love uh, the job you've got. We have testimony earlier that there was at least one person who absolutely thinks they've got God's job for them earlier today. Great to hear. Um, And I I did love it. I I loved the people. I loved the pace. I loved the creativity. And the lunches were just fantastic. So there you have it. Things change. But my testimony, my testimony is this. I saw God, God, do amazing things in that advertising agency on Madison Avenue. I saw him answer prayer on prayer. I saw him over time draw people to himself. I saw him heal someone on the 10th floor of a New York Madison Avenue advertising agency in the middle of the day. I saw him impact the work itself. I saw him change the heart of an, an impossible client. Perhaps you don't have any impossible people in your world. But uh, for us, this was for everybody else. There were two of us who were Christians in that particular team. And we were praying like mad that this person, a difficult, difficult person, would at least respond in a sensible way to a mistake that we had genuinely made. And it was one of those days when Proverbs 21.1 came to life. The king's heart is like a stream of water uh, in the hand of the Lord, and the queen's heart was indeed like that, and uh, we escaped with our lives. And I saw him guide me through career disappointment, uh, through character failure, and romantic catastrophes. (laughs) Far too many of those, alas. So if you like God at work in an ordinary job and on a fairly ordinary street, really, amongst ordinary people. So my testimony really is not that you can uh, trust me because I used to work in advertising, but rather that we can trust. We can trust God, and we can trust God, if you like, insofar as they're our people, with his people in any context that they find themselves in, whether that's a school gate, a lecture room, a bowling green, whatever. Is there really any place that... God, the King of the universe, cannot work. Is there any person who's given their life to him he cannot work through and is probably already working through in ways often they cannot see and perhaps we can't either? Is there any task he's not concerned about? Anyway, now I uh, work at London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, you heard. And... uh, Normally when I'm asked to talk about uh, what we do, I use the um, example of uh, probably the most admired um, of post-war British male heroes, a man who can be relied on to change the world, or at least save the world, once every three years, and that, of course, is Bond, James Bond. Now, Bond, James Bond um, is not widely acclaimed in Christian circles, though... uh, I hope that's the case for you. <laughs> but I, but I suspect there is probably not a man in the room who has not imagined himself at some point in his life as Bond, James Bond. Uh, clearly, I have some evidence of this.
So, and, the, and the role, by the way, is, is up. It, it's up in the next couple of years. So be nice to him, or you may, you, you may lose him to Cubby Broccoli, the Cubby Broccoli family. Although also, I suppose with that haircut, maybe Vin Diesel, Fast and Furious, would be more your sort of thing. <laughs> Though Vin Diesel never dro drove a Fabia or an Octavia, I suspect. <laughs> On that topic of uh, losing things, it is, uh, perhaps, perhaps you know, perhaps you know, this is St. Anthony of Padua's uh, Saints' Day. Uh, so for those of you who have lost your worship booklet, you know who to pray to. Uh, the man who has uh, lost things, I think, not lost causes. Most of us, of course, are a bit more like Johnny English than James Bond, and uh, sort of <laughs> that kind of a person. And, uh, but Bond has some qualities worthy of praise, I and mean, he is courageous. I wonder if that was one of your words for the diocese. Persevering and resourceful is the master of technology, never its slave. He's decisive and patriotic. He may, like Samson, sleep with the enemy, but unlike Samson, he never gives away secrets critical to national security. He's strong, agile, multi-skilled, intelligent, witty, cultured, and honest. And as one woman screamed out at a seminar, he's gorgeous. <laughs> well, I comfort myself with the knowledge that he is also a male chauvinist pig an emotional desert and a spiritual black hole. But apart from that, <laughs> when Bond, James Bond, goes on his missions to save the world, five things are true. He is properly briefed, is he not? He is properly trained. He is resourced. He is commissioned. And he is supported in his role that he has been authorized, given authority to do in the world for the sake of his nation. So when we ask ourselves whether adult Christians uh, feel themselves to be properly brief, trained, resourced, commissioned, and supported, on the whole, um, back in the 80s and the 70s, and uh, frankly still today, most of them tell us that they are not. And that is why uh, Stott, uh, John Stott, um, he's the one uh, founded the London Institute, he's the one on the right, in case you don't know. Um, <coughs> founded the Institute because of his tremendous heart to see God's people um, fueled, envisioned, resourced for their, for their role in God's mission in daily life, and tremendous heart to see actually the people of God equipped for it. So our goal really is to empower Christians to make a difference in the world, that's one way of putting it, and to help church leaders help them do it have a larger team these days doing a variety of things, looking at core church culture, how do we change that? Looking at group life, how can we help people see work together in groups to do that at worship, a variety of resources on that and indeed on preaching. So there's stuff if you want it. Now we've been experimenting and a lot of it's available, I should do my advertising bit, shouldn't I? If you go into the sports hall to the right, Today, this day, you will never get a better price for our resources. Most of them are at five pounds, not six pounds, not seven pounds, not eight pounds, not nine pounds, about ten pounds, about five pounds. You will never get a better price. There are people in Amazon weeping at this price, <laughs> at this very moment. Um, so avail yourself if you think you may ever need them. Now we've been looking at this, obviously as you've heard for quite a long time, how do we, how do we, in an ordinary local church, across the streams, it's important to note that we've worked with dioceses and, and people from across the streams, liberal, middle of the road, Anglo-Catholic, reform, whatever. Um, it seems to have traction across the streams because God is interested in growing people, whatever their stream. And, uh, so we've been involved in this, I was involved in this, and of course this is an answer to prayer, really. These two great convictions that came out of the setting God's people free, that until laity and clergy are convinced, based on our baptismal mutuality, that we indeed are equal in worth and status, complementary in gifting and vocation, mutually accountable in discipleship, and equal partners in mission, we will never form Christian communities that can evangelize the nation. Amen. Amen. I think they're very beautiful words. Uh, they, they, they reflect, um, primarily actually written by, by Bishop Philip North, as it happens, uh, who I work with on this, uh, that particular set of words, a very high sense of the calling of the ordained clergy and a very high sense of the calling of, of lay people, a different and complementary calling to ministry. And then it goes on, um, 
to say until together, and again this tr sense of together, this mutuality, what do we have to learn from one another? Um, ordained and lay, we form and equip lay people to follow Jesus confidently. There's that word that is all over the place now, in every sphere of life, in ways that demonstrate the gospel. We will never really set God's people free to evangelize the nation. And it's setting free to evangelize the nation because clearly in Christ we are free, for freedom Christ has set us free. We have been made free. We are free from, but we're also free for. And it's that free for. If you like that all God's people would be convinced that they are by grace sent and hikonos, hikonoi. I wonder how much of what we just heard Bishop Pete speak would, would actually in any way be inapplicable to speak on a Sunday morning to, to the people that you speak to, apart from the specifics of your own ordained call. How much of being sent, empowered, knowing that you're not somehow competent, but, but actually in God that they are, that they've been sent, like sheaves among wolves, how much would not be appropriate? Wouldn't it be great if everybody was aware of how much more awesome was the word that Bishop Pete used, how much more awesome it is to bear the fragrance of Christ in all the places that people go than to be a thoroughfare in an imperial triumph on the streets of Rome. I guess that's my heart. So today's title, Empowering God's People for Everyday Mission, I'd like to um, travel through this with you. We'll see how far we get. I realize um, there are all kinds of entry points to this. There are theological entry points. There are practical entry points. Um, I'm going to try to, sh if you like, give a, a, a sense of what it might feel like for some people um, who've you know, awakened to this kind of way of, of living. So I'm going to be in with a story, and uh, from time to time, I'm going to sort of invite you on your tables to talk, and we'll take some feedback. We have two... Uh, very fit runners wandering around with Mike, so we'll be able to take the feedback in that way. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a story, and then you can see what you hear. Um, this is a story of uh, a, a youngish woman, as it happens, called Victoria, and I met her a couple of years ago, and she, at that time, had taken up her first, uh, if you like, a job as an apprentice hairdresser in Bath, going to a sort of what you might call a medium-sized Anglican church there. And uh, she'd been in the job just over a month, it was a very busy salon. Uh, there's always something to do. I don't know if you've ever been a hairdresser, but they're busy places. And everything when you're at the bottom of the pile has got to be done very quickly and very accurately. And uh, these days, of course, you've got to take coffee orders for whatever it might be. You know, it's not just a cup of coffee nowadays, is it? It's, uh, would you like a flat white? Would you like a, a heart on it or a tree on it? Um, would you like a cappuccino? Would you like a latte? Would you like chocolate sprinkles? Would you like marshmallow? Would you like caramel? Would you like hazelnut? And if you're in Glasgow, would you like chips on top? Whatever it might be. <laughs> you know, this, 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 all of this sort of stuff. And she was actually, I think, first job, feeling a bit of pressure. And her vicar commissioned her after three weeks. He commissioned her into this role. And she said to me that she was feeling a much greater sense of peace about that. Anyway, I, I was talking to her and I, because I'd heard that, um, in a sense, uh, she had a vision for this, I, I invited her up. There were about 300 people in, in the room. It was a, a bath deanery sort of thing. And I said to her, I asked her this question, which in retrospect was really a very unfair question. So I assume it came from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Because <laughs> if it didn't, I have to repent. Uh, so I said to her, what difference does being a Christian make to the way you wash someone's hair? And uh, she said this. I pray for them as I massage in the conditioner. So my question to you is... What struck you about that story, if anything? And what beliefs do you think Victoria holds? So give you a couple of minutes on your tables, if you're willing. What struck you about that story, if anything? And what beliefs does Victoria hold? There's much more that could be said. I mean, some people have seen a very priestly act, and that's a very intimate thing, having your hair washed by somebody. Many people are never touched one week to another, particularly some older people. And there's something int intimate about that, isn't it? You know, Perhaps uh, Vicar should go around blessing uh, conditioner in hair salons. <laughs> Holy conditioner. I'm not sure whether there's any theology for that. There's something quite intimate about that, about that touch. 
And there is that sense that whether or not she ever sees the answers to those prayers, um, she's trusting that God is doing something in those lives and that he is indeed worthy of it. Um, I wonder what kind of church community makes a disciple like Victoria. How does she somehow, at 19, know to do that? <laughs> That's a question, isn't it? Know that something that, in the context of most middle-class communities, being an apprentice hairdresser would be slightly frowned about. And That's not what you normally do if you've got, as she does, you know, two A stars and an A or whatever she got. So it's an interesting thing, isn't it, about, about what kind of community generates that kind of understandings. Now, what I would want to say about uh, the things we're going to say and the things we've learned is that the good news about um, setting God's people free and uh, making disciples in general for all of life is that you really do not need any money at all to do this. You just don't. You don't need any new staff. You don't need any new resources. They will help you, the right ones, but you don't need them to do this. It's quite possible that you don't need to, do, to add anything to your to-do list. Nothing to your to-do list except one thing I'm going to suggest at the end. <laughs> because what this is, is a consciousness. It's a way of seeing people and a way of seeing the world. And when you see it this way, you can't see it any other way. So you pray every week, or somebody does in intercessions, what's the content? You introduce a service every week, and how do you do it? You send people out into the world, and how do you do it? You choose hymns, and what are they? You have conversations with people, sometimes with leaders, sometimes with people in pain, and so on and so forth. What questions do you ask them? At root, this is about a consciousness. It's a posture towards God's people, an understanding of our own role in their lives. But it's a posture held in tension with an historic culture across the denominations globally which militates against those sorts of conversations and that way of understanding who lay people are and that way of lay people understanding who you are. One uh, vicar we worked with uh, for a while said this, the strongest effect on me personally has been a new sense of the implications of the words, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. I wonder, um, I, as, as a lay person, I, I absolutely love those words. And they're amazingly rich. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. But I wonder what's in our hearts and our heads when we say that over a set of people before they go that, if that's some, those are the words that you use or whatever words you do use. I'm just telling you what he said. But what, what's in our hearts and our heads and what do we think is in their heart and in their heads when they hear those words? Do they think, go now to love and serve the Lord, go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the hairdresser? Do they think go now to love and serve the Lord at the school gate? Do they think go now to love and serve the Lord as you write an essay on Zambian copper mines in the 18th century? Is, is that what's going on? Now, um, that sentence, um, often when I've heard it, it always seems to me to work in two directions, one forwards and one backwards. Um, on the basis of all that we've done together, and often priests will say, so, go, or now go. And, and it's interesting, isn't it? As if on the basis of all that we've done together as a gathered community, welcome and praise, confession and creed, intercession and offertory, word and sacrament, on the basis of the shalom that we have enjoyed with one another and shared with one another in Christ, on the basis of all that we have shared together and all that Christ has done in us by his spirit through word and sacrament, on the, case, on the basis of all that we have received, with all that go in peace to love and serve the Lord. So it works in two directions. The gathered community 
coming together in Christ, breathing in, ministering to one another, seeking his face for the world and then going out into the world. Now the truth at the moment is that many Christians have a quite a developed idea of how they might serve God in the gathered context. But overall, and again I project nothing on anybody here because contexts are so diverse and, uh, context, and, and churches are diverse within themselves. Um, are they not? Some people get this, some people don't. But um, the sense that when I go out there I have an imagination for what that looks like and how I can be fruitful. Well, I'm not sure many people have that. And one of the first things that we've found that we have to help people see is that. That the places they go to naturally, without adding anything to their schedule, without needing any more money, without having to go on any courses or anything like that, the places where they go naturally may almost certainly be places where God is working through them and can work through them. So let me tell you about um, um, Thelma. Thelma is uh, older than anyone in this room. She's 93 years old. I think she's older than anyone in this room looking around. Um, she's 93 years old. She's West Midlands, um, just outside Birmingham, West Bromwich woman. And uh, she's been in a part of a church called Rainbow Community Church. It's a small church. That's pretty much the whole church. Um, and uh, she was taken through a little, and again, um, this is not about a resource. She was taken through this resource by her minister, uh, and it's called Life on the Front Line. And the whole church went through it, all 12 or 15 of them. And Thelma's one of those people who just loves the church, and she's been in the church a long time. She's had a lot of sermons, done a lot of praying. She loves to minister to people and so on. But I think, you know, she would, she, I was told she would say, well, you know, I don't really think I've got a, a mission, my own thing. I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly waiting to die, but I'm not. <laughs> She's what, um, perhaps, what the, the, the Diocese of Gloucester call loyals. Uh, uh, loyals, they have a category called loyals and intention. Loyals are those people who just love Jesus, they come to church, they do stuff, they're devoted, they're in there, but, but they think, you know, the vicar does it, that's good, we'll help the vicar or the curate or the archdeacon or whatever. And I don't really think I've got anything out there. And if somebody's ill, well, probably that's the vicar's job. But they love God. They love Christ. And there are lots of churches like that. And Thelma's a bit like that. Anyway, she was taken through this thing called Life on the Front Line. And suddenly she realized she had a mission field, if you want to use that language. A front line, if you like, which is the language we use. And I understand from earlier that militaristic language may not go down well in Sheffield, but it, it works for some people. And what she realized was her front line was the Asian convenience store at the bottom of her road that she hobbled to. Because uh, Thelma at 93 was not as, as quick on her pins as she was when she was 89. And so she began to pray for that family and to pray blessing on their business and to go in and spend a little bit longer over her shopping and to connect to people and so on and so forth. And although her p friends begged her, please let us pick up your shopping because you're going to fall over and hurt yourself. <coughs> come rain, come shine, come snow, whatever, there is Thelma. That's her folk. And interestingly, the, the family <laughs> took to carrying her shopping home for her, which is a double whammy. Not only does she get her shopping carried home, but she gets 10 minutes of conversation. Isn't that sweet? Now, um, my point really is, Thelma didn't need another sermon. Well, at one level she got one, but she didn't really need that. She just needed to see something differently. She had an opportunity already. She didn't need to be invited into a program or anything. What she needed to see was what was absolutely in front of her. She could be a light in that context. To see her life, her daily life, through God's eyes, splashing the water of her baptism in that supermarket. And so her confidence grew. Now to a point that was made earlier about intimacy and relationship with God, one of the things I find most encouraging about this is that whatever else may come out of Selma's ministry there, prayers offered 
that the Lord is hearing. Blessing offered, care offered, kindness offered, words about Christ shared, perhaps people coming close to Christ, perhaps actually some of them becoming followers of Jesus. Here for me is one of the really most significant things. Thelma is excited about her relationship with God in the everyday. Now, if you can get people excited about their relationship with God, and that's what she brings back to Sunday. The church doesn't become less significant, it becomes more significant. Pray with me, please. Yeah. I need some help. How do I answer that question? Whatever. The call to make disciples is a call to take a risk. That in the doing of that, which obviously at some level is a shift, that we trust the Lord for those things that we now think that if we really send people out, will not now be done in the local church because they'll be doing stuff outside. <laughs> that is not our experience. Our experience is that people who get excited about God out there get more excited about local church because they need us. They give back. Jesus builds his church. He tells us to make disciples. But what that uh, minister did when she did it for Thelma, who's 93, she did it for everybody else in the church. The lights started to go on in all kinds of places. And there are lots of definitions of disciples, but disciple, one of them might be a disciple of someone learning the way of Jesus in their context at this time. Learning the way of Jesus as a 93-year-old like Tamara, as a 19-year-old or a 9-year-old in a school or a 29-year-old in a dead-end job or a 39-year-old at home with three kids under four, whatever. Or a 59-year-old caring for a parent. Someone learning the way of Jesus in their context at that time. So let me tell you another story, this story of uh, an Anglican woman in Gateshead. Her name is uh, Isabel, and Isabel is in her uh, late 50s, as it turns out, and uh, she's in a room with uh, her home group. I don't know how many of you have those sorts of things, but that's what she had, a smallish church, this one, um, and she's in a room with her home group, and the vicar is there, and uh, as it happens, so is one of my colleagues, and they're talking about frontline. Where's your front line? And again, don't get hung on the language. Different dioceses use different language for this, but it's important to have a shared language for daily mission, um, whatever it might be. And they're going around the room, and they're all saying, well, I think mine's this and mine's that. And they come to Isabel, and Isabel's kind of scratching her head and going, well, I don't really think I have a front line. And there's that embarrassing moment when everyone else is with the program in the room and somebody isn't. So Neil, my colleague, who, who wrote the book Imagine Church, and he tells this story in there. It was a really significant moment. So, so, so Isabel, tell me about your family. And Isabel starts talking about family. said, oh, my grandchildren, I love my grandchildren. And, you know, and my oldest grandchildren, she often comes around for, for lunch on Sunday. Um, doesn't come to church, but she comes around to lunch on Sunday three or four times a month. And, you know, she always asks me about the sermon and about, about church and stuff. We have a little chat. And then Neil said, to her, so uh, how old is your is your grandchild. And she said, uh, 23. I don't know how you do the maths on that, but there it was, 23. And the room gasped. Do you mean to say that you're having an evangelistic conversation about the content of the sermon and of the service three or four times a, a month over time with, with a young person in their 20s? <laughs> Well, yes, I suppose I am. I didn't think my family counted. <laughs> A lot of things happened in that room that day. Isabel changed uh, within uh, three months. Uh, Neil, it was a church we were working with over three years, so Neil went back and she discovered that, as well, I'm really cooking on gas now. My daughter, not just my girl, is coming, is coming uh, uh, to church and so on. So uh, it was a real excitement. And the group changed. The group said, we've got to pray for you. And the vicar thought, I thought I was preaching to people over 50. Which he was. But then he realized he was equipping his team 
for the relationships they've got outside. So then he began to think about, what am I going to say at 11 o'clock that Isabel can use at 1? What am I going to say at 11 that Isabel can use at 1? Who's in my mind and where are they? So it looks like a tiny thing, doesn't it? All these things are tiny. But they are profound shifts in consciousness and in orientation. <laughs> he happened to be in the room, so he found out. So one of the first steps is to help people see that they do have a context, a place in the world where that God cares about, and to be convinced that he does care about it. Now, there are all kinds of reasons why they might not believe that, and some are institutional and cultural, and some to do with vocation and so on, and some to do with a hierarchy that exists, but none of us want to exist, and we don't really want it, but it does exist. And we have a kind of holy hierarchy in the church. You know, pastors are at the top, bathed in halonic light, and uh, although these days, if you're in certain streams of the church, worship leaders are the heroes. Uh, so that's why everyone wants to be if they're 19 and can play guitar. Uh, and then you have pastors below that, and then you have missionaries. Uh, if, as long as they're overseas, when they come back, well then, you know, with their terrible slides, no one's interested. And then you have parachurch workers, people who work for the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, unbelievably, halonically, holy people, as you can tell. Uh, elders, if you have them, and then you have deacons, you certainly have them, and they're obviously holier than uh, church members, who are holier than poor Christians, who are holier than uh, middle-income Christians, who are definitely holier than rich Christians. Uh, because uh, where there is muck, there is brass. Or rather, where there is brass, there is muck. And the muck is at the heart of every woman or man who makes brass, a real suspicion of people who create wealth. It's a bit sad, isn't it? There are many, many warnings for the rich in the New Testament. But it's sad that the church makes heroes of those who alleviate poverty and not heroes of those who prevent it in the first place. And then, of course, everybody's holier than former advertising executives. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife tells me. <laughs> that's, it's really much more like that, isn't it? And, uh, of course, that still applies. Um, if you like, theologically, they, people may simply not be convinced that their whole of life is of import to God, that the missio dei, the mission that God is working out, that God is um, initiating and working through, that, they, that has really nothing to do with their daily life. But as you know, and um, excuse the shortness of this, but I think this is familiar territory for you, you know, what does Paul say? about the mission. What did he say about the mission of Jesus? That Jesus is the image, praise him, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, by Christ, all things, all things, all things were created. Things in heaven, things on earth, things visible, toucans, elephants, bananas. That is the best dressed toucan in creation. I defy you to find a better dressed toucan. Beautiful. Look at those blue suede shoes and the lovely color rhymes. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord and so does that keel build toucan. Things visible and things invisible. Here's a picture of something invisible if you're looking for one. All things were created by him and for him. So of course he's interested in all things. He owns them and he made them. He didn't make them and give them to somebody else to own. He gave them to somebody else to steward. Difference. And so this is the Christ who is Lord over every one of these places in this diocese and beyond where your people are probably right now, some of them. But as you know, he has more in mind. The triune God has more in mind than mere maintenance he has not left his creation. Through Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making shalom, peace, through his blood shed on the cross. He wants to, his intention is, he has inaugurated an era of history in which all things are being renewed. And it is this mission that he invites us to participate in. This is, we are commissioned into this. So everything we do, Everything anybody does is important to the creator God because it has an impact on creation that he has made and people created in his image. And everything is important to the redeemer, reconciler, restorer, renewer God because everything anybody does has an impact on the creation and on people made in his image with whom he wants to be fully 
reconciled. This is, if you like, the great project, Christ Lord over all. There is an American guy some of you may be familiar with. He's, he's from a particular stream of the church, but I think he speaks for many people beyond it. A guy called Tony Campolo. Anybody know him? If you've heard him, you know that he's a very low energy, very quietly spoken friar, sort of a Benedictine monk kind of feel to him. And uh, he once said this, he once said, evangelism, he said, and it would be about that volume, evangelism, he said, is an invitation to join a movement to change the world. Well, there you go. And he actually speaks, if you know, with his eyes closed like this. I don't, I don't quite know why that is. I think he has the script on his eyelids. And uh, I, I apologize to the lady from Florida for my poor American accent. But, uh, you know, you know and I know that evangelism is more than that, and so does he. But it's never less. As uh, one guy from this part of the world said, for young people, it's got to be worth it. Is that a cause worth being part of? Without the triumphalism, I think so. So we're empowered to become new creations in Christ and therefore to seek the peace and prosperity as the people in Babylon were called to, the Jewish people in Babylon, of the city to which I've carried you into exile. I love the seeking and the praying. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. This is our calling. And I think it's important to make this connection for people between this grand design, this beautiful plan of restoration and redemption, and their daily life. See, Paul can write in Colossians 3, whatever you do in word and deed, not because he's exhorting them merely to, to be good examples to people and to do work well, but because it's based on Colossians 1. All things matter, therefore everything you do matters. All, 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 all our whatevers he weaves into his whole. So whole life's disciples need to know what their front line is, how they fit into God's mission, and what fruitfulness for them might look like. Now, this is an interesting question. What does uh, fruitfulness look like? Because clearly, at one level, we know, this is the children's talk bit, sorry about this. Uh, we know that God's people are in the world. Here they are, little red dots, and they're in the world. And the question is, do we, do we think they can make a difference? Do they think they are making a difference? What kind of disciples do we have an imagination for? Do we think we've got Thelmas and they could become like Thelma did? Do we think we've got Victorias and they could become like that? Or do we look out on a Sunday and think, prayerful imagination or is it something like this there's something for somebody to do for the next two minutes while I carry on talking <laughs> what does fruitfulness look like people that make a difference in the world changing things a while back I went to a place called Scotland I don't know if any Scots in the room any, any Scots in the room apparently not and uh, to work with a group of late 20 somethings early 30 somethings um, to go up over three years um, for two days every three months to, to see what would fruitfulness look like for that generation in the places they were. One was a housewife, one was a graphic designer, one was a teacher, one was an actress, one sold stuff, a retail assistant, if you like, one was a doctor, so a variety of people and so on. And uh, after about the third trip, these people have been hand-picked um, as people really committed to making a difference in the world, and um, primarily for them in their workplace. And after a while, we noticed something. None of these people thought they were doing anything for God, except we thought they were doing amazing things for God. So they were, if you like, confident employees. They were doing a good job, but they were not confident disciples. One of them, um, who at the time I think was 34 years old, and speaking of primary school education, she had turned round two failing schools in East Glasgow at the age of 34, which is an incredible achievement for anybody. I mean, to turn around a small business with five people is amazing. To turn around two failing schools. And she couldn't see that that had anything to do with God's mission or what at all. <coughs> Hundreds of children better educated. Hundreds of guardians, parents, uh, carers, 
more confident in the school, pleased. Our community shifted because this is a terrible place to live, but we've got a good school. <laughs> what difference that makes, and some of you know that. You've got a good school. It's hope. Couldn't see it. And the reason why was because the, they thought the only marks of fruitfulness were either an evangelistic conversation or what you might call direct social action. As in, I'm part of um, Christian poverty or I take food to my neighbour or I work with the homeless once a week and all those wonderful things that local churches do, whether formally or informally. In other words, their view of fruitfulness was too narrow. And therefore, they thought they were no good. Because if the only mark of fruitfulness is an evangelistic conversation or direct social action, and you are working in Tesco's, you ain't going to have too many opportunities to share the gospel as you're stacking the shelves. Now, you may have one a week in the back of the coffee room or whatever, and you don't have too much opportunity while you're doing that to do direct social action. Confidence. So they were blind to what was going on in them. So I'm going to give another little um, conversation moment here and tell you another story. This one is about a bloke. Um, and uh, we're in a room, 15 men, um, not on a dead man's chest, and uh, was led. And the guy there who was in telecoms now is a curate in Luton in his mid-40s. And he asked us this question. I realize it's a jargony question, so excuse the jargon. But this is the question he asked. I think we knew what he meant. What are you good at in the Lord at, wo at work? Okay. So he's asking a group of uh, primarily Southern English men, what are you good at? You're not going to get an answer. Southern English men want you to know they're brilliant at everything, but they're not going to tell you. So there was complete silence, which I think he had anticipated, because he had all these post-it notes on the... So he said, why, why don't you write something on a post-it note? Everyone wrote something on a post-it note. So he said, you've written it down. You might as well speak it out. Clever, I thought. Clever. So then he said, so then somebody started to speak. And the person, person, person who started to speak, a guy called Kurt, and I'm going to say it pretty much like he said it. He's sitting in a chair, and he's looking down at, at, at a coffee table. And uh, he says this. Um, I'm a, some of you know I'm a policeman. I work in armed protection. So of course, he's got our attention. <laughs> and then he says, I protect the prime minister at number 10. He definitely has our attention. And he says, well, you know, it's a pretty macho team, probably. These are people prepared to kill other people, prepared to be killed uh, in the protection of politicians of whichever party. And he said, over the years, there's been quite a lot of conflict. And um, over the years, uh, I found I'm quite good at bringing people back together. And there was a silence. So what struck you? What might you have said after that? What might you affirm? Have a couple of minutes around your tables. Thank you. And thank you for that. Well, indeed, somebody said in the room, just picking up on, on the theme, somebody said, you've got a ministry of reconciliation. And it was like, not that he won the lottery, maybe that would have, it was like his face just beamed. It was like, oh my goodness, I've got a ministry of reconciliation, except it wasn't like that, it was too modest for that. I've got a ministry of reconciliation, oh my goodness. And then someone said, yeah, blessed are the peacemakers, that's what you're doing, amazing, wow. And suddenly his whole demeanor changed, the whole room changed because it had been given a biblical category. It had been affirmed by the community in biblical terms. And you're quite right that in the same way that you know, the fact that David had learned to throw a stone out of a sling accurately at, say, 200 yards, which you, know, which you can do so well, is analogous, and therefore defeat Goliath, is analogous to his ability to take a Glock pistol and shoot for the hip, from the hip, which is difficult to do um, under extreme circumstances and hit the right target. Those things are there too, but in this case, it was also that. And suddenly, his shoulders went back, and we went round the room, and what was released was in effect, people thinking biblically about what people were saying and affirming that. And that was the difference, the community seeing the bigger picture for the person, because often we can't see it for ourselves. People are much more fruitful than we know. 
already, I think. Um, so, you know, before he hadn't seen it, and if you don't see it, you don't necessarily expect God to work. You don't consciously, in a sense, make yourself available to God in the situation. You don't necessarily ask God for help. But when you see that that's your place and that you can work through, then, then you know God can work. You begin to expect God to work. You make yourself available to God. You ask God for help. You ask other people to help you. So there's a massive difference when somebody sees that, that they can actually make a difference for God in that place. Or actually, in every case, that they already had been. Catch someone doing something good. How do you build confidence? Hey, you can already walk. Now let's, let's, let's go a bit quicker, whatever. So we enable people to read their lives through a gospel lens or a biblical lens, whatever language. And so we began to look for ways of that. Fruitfulness is inevitably in Christ, but we, it always comes out of abiding in Christ and from him and by his spirit. And, but we, we need to find some categories. So we found six, and they've been helpful to many people. Modeling godly character, and you can do that at home, and you can do it at work. You can do it in a restaurant. You can minister, make good work cooking at home or cooking in a restaurant or whatever. You can minister grace and love in all kinds of places. You can mold a culture by putting a tea light, uh, you know, dinner, or you can mold a culture in a business by changing the evaluation systems or whatever it might be. We've got hundreds of examples of this. You can be a mouthpiece for truth and justice by knocking on the council door about an issue. And you'll be a mouthpiece for truth and justice by snuffing out gossip at the school gates. And you have an opportunity to be the message for the gospel in all kinds of rich ways. And a frame was given to people, and then they began to see how they could be fruitful. And it's been fruitful. So what do their people need to know? That what their front line is, how they fit into God's mission, what fruitfulness looks like, and how they've already been fruitful. But briefly, as we close, just a few thoughts about, and only a few, about creating whole life disciple-making churches and your own call to that. Clearly all those things are only a, a start because we are dealing with a culture and cultures are difficult to change. But, the, but the, the upside is huge for the community of Christ in our land. The reality is we have lots now of churches who are really rather good, and I'm sure m- most of your churches are too, at doing neighbourhood and local ministry. And it's great. And there are a number of churches of all traditions engaged in supporting global mission in a variety of ways. Prayerfully and twinning and so on and so forth, sending people, sending money and so on. But the middle cog, the front line or workplaces or where people spend their time, that's the place where if we're going to change society in the world, which is part of your mission, that's the place where people are weakest and where the church overall is weakest. But it doesn't necessarily begin with a theology of performance related pay or a sophisticated understanding of engineering. It begins with just helping people see that their places, that's where they are. How can we help you grow there? So there are a variety of ways of doing this and most of them begin small with very small actions which over time change things. This is not a, it is a a seismic revolution, as the Archbishop of Canterbury put the challenge to the church, but it is not one that requires total change instantly. Everywhere where we've worked, it's almost always small things done in, in the right direction. I'll give you one example. You interview one person, uh, one, a very successful one, sorry, um, for two minutes on a Sunday service. What do you do? I'm a plumber. Tell us about that. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? What does it feel like? What are you trusted with? How can we pray for you? Well, there's a lot of things about plumbing, you know. My plumber believes that God created him to be a plumber. He became a Christian when he was 50. <laughs> and he talks about that. He talks about being trusted in the context, how people trust him. He talks about going into places where sometimes people are very lonely and ministering. There. He talks about money. <laughs> and giving people a fair price, whatever it is. He talks about not doing some things, and so on and so forth. Well, that's just one example. It doesn't matter, really, because what happens when you do that is you make the layperson a hero, you say your story is valuable to us, it affirms other lay people, and here's what happens, it triggers a conversation. Somebody says, I'm really under pressure. Over coffee, five people come and talk to that person. How do you handle this? How I handle it? The reality is in local church life, what is celebrated is replicated. What is celebrated is replicated. 
What you celebrate tells people your culture. What you pray about tells people your culture. And I just want to give you a couple of other little examples of how simple this is, but actually how profound. How is it that we, how do we do, how do we begin to shift these little markers in our church life in the 10 or so hours we might spend together and change the 110? Here's a, here's a well-known hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Now, some of you will use PowerPoint slides and some of you won't. So just treat this as an example of a shift in perspective. People who do use PowerPoint slides often put pictures like this behind those sorts of uh, words. And the number of hymns that I have seen with uh, pictures of nature uh, cannot be counted. They are like sand on the seashore and stars in the sky. Uh, or we might have something like that, and sunset and so on. That's where we get vision. That's where God is. That's where you find him. And indeed, God is there. But what happens if you do this? Or that? Or that? Or that? Or that? There is a prize of, for the person who knows where all these people, places come from. Uh, or whose kitchen that is? <laughs> you might say it's Bishop's Pete's, but I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> suddenly something shifts. Something shifts in people. Really? God there? It's tiny. Some of you are going to make a slide anyway. What difference? So there are two ways to pursue this. Um, that's where some people are going tonight after the dinner. Um, these little one degree shifts. To do the same things in a whole life way. Things you're already doing. And sometimes to do a new thing in a new way. And uh, if you'd ask me, well, I think our team, and uh, we have five, um, on our church-facing team, we have five ministers, all of them still work in local churches, either half-time or two days a week, and Andrew's with us today. So these are people who've been doing this for years and experimenting with it, getting some of it right and some of it wrong, and learning from that. If you ask people who've followed on on this, what is the one thing the one thing that has most, had most impact on enabling them to make whole life disciples, the one thing, and this is the only thing that takes time, is to go visit someone on their front line. Whether that is a bowls club, a tennis club, a whippet walking club, whatever, where they are, and stand, walk where they walk, and look at it. It will transform them if they're willing for it to happen. Utterly transform them. They will never forget it. Not everyone wants it, and therefore you can't go. You may or may not be able to wear a dog collar. It might be right, it might be wrong. There are ways to go about it. There's something on our website about that. It hugely changes things, and uh, there are some other ideas in there. And the reason for this is, and the reason why it's a difficult thing is, if you take this the bell curve of people in the church, Say 20% of people are in pain, and 20% of people are in leadership, and there's everyone else. So where does your time go? People in pain, people in leadership. Your leaders, the people who are doing things for you, it's very hard to get connected to everyone else. So somehow there has to be a bit of time for that 60% or 70% of people to, to, to learn their world to walk with Thelma and meet those people and think, what would help her? As uh, one guy said, as a minister, no one phones you up to let you know that they're having an average day. <laughs> Do they? They don't. But it's usually in the average day that opportunities for mission comes. One guy went um, to this guy's workplace. It happened to be an office. I don't know what part of the country he was in, white collar kind of context. And the vicar turns up and he's wearing his dog collar. And the guy says, uh, to the vicar, Peter, they don't know I'm a Christian. So Peter says, how are we going to play that? You know, do you want me to take the collar off? Do you want me to come back another day? Whatever. Well, so they're going to find out today, aren't they? <laughs> and for him, that was a really positive thing. He'd made his decision. I'm coming out as a Christian, if you like. I'm going, they're going to know. People are going to ask me afterwards. Fantastic. Now, that is not the goal. The goal is for you to grow and see and preach differently as a result, to hear a story and think, oh gosh, that's like this, that's like that. I have to say, it is once a month, once every six weeks, if you could begin there, 
All the bishops in London did it. Um, people are doing it all over the place, but um, it's hard to make that time. Lucky you're not in Liverpool. If you've been in Liverpool under, under uh, James Jones, he made all his curates do it, so here you have it. So here are people in all kinds of places. Now what I've been talking about today really is a very profound shift in the culture of local church for the sake of the nation, for the sake of the people, for the liberation of people into a richer relationship with Christ day by day. A richer relationship with Christ day by day. I don't want to say that this is easy. I was hugely encouraged by a vision which ends in 2025. We reckon it takes five to seven years to change the culture of a local church in this direction because it's a culture change. And when you leave, will it stay? Five to seven years. There are no swift silver bullets to this. This is, if you like, a long obedience in the same direction. And we, we feel like we've only just begun, as the song goes, in learning how to be obedient to Christ's call to go and make disciples. Uh, we certainly don't have all the answers, but we have some. And we crave your partnership and fellowship in learning more for the sake of his kingdom and his glory. May it be so. And in this and in your ministry, the Lord be with you. Amen.